In addition to presenting him with an honorary degree, it is also my great privilege to welcome this most esteemed son of Albright to serve as this year's commencement speaker. One would be hard pressed to find a finer example of the versatility, durability, and adaptability of a liberal arts education than Bob Spitz. He is a member of the 13th Street Gang, having been born, raised, and educated along with this familiar, along this familiar thoroughfare of ours here in Reading. Once he strayed off the block, however, his life veered into diverse and fascinating realms. A longtime musician, Mr. Spitz moved to New York after graduating and met a promising young songwriter named Bruce Springsteen, whom he managed and occasionally played with for the next six years. In 1978, Mr. Spitz moved on to manage Elton John, eventually retiring from the music business in 1980 to pursue his love of writing. He is the author of seven books, including Barefoot in Babylon, the eye-opening documentary of the Woodstock Music Festival, and The Beatles, his definitive best-selling biography of the phenomenal supergroup. Mr. Spitz's screenplay, The Silent Victim, was made into a movie, and his articles have appeared in major publications, including the New York Times Magazine, The Washington Post, Esquire, GQ, Rolling Stone, Condé Nast Traveler, and O, oh, The Opera Magazine. His biography, Deary, The Remarkable Life of Julia Child, will be published on the centenary of her birth this August. He is currently working with Graham Nash on the singer's memoir. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to present to you uh, Bob Spitz, class of 71. <laughs> Professor Pankratz, President McMillan, trustees, faculties, friends, class of 2012. Wow. 2012 blows my mind. <laughs> Here's a fact about Albright College that many of you might not know. There's a box that the college trustees keep. It's a centuries-old receptacle made of molten steel and covered in thick, gnarled vines that's kept in a cistern located several hundred feet below the basement of the science building and is guarded by two fire-breathing dragons and a cousin of, a cousin of Professor Brogan. <laughs> now, very few mortals have ever looked inside this box but those who have know that it contains only a single piece of paper, a list. It's a list of people who should never be invited to give the commencement address at Albright College. <laughs> and my name is at the top of it. Obviously, President McMillan, uh, he missed uh, that list, seen that list, and he's got some explaining to do at the next trustees meeting. Um, I can only imagine that if my speech professor, Mrs. Shirk, is in attendance today, she is, without a doubt, speechless. <laughs> she warned me that one day I'd have to put her techniques to good use, but I assure you this moment never crossed her mind. Here I am, Mrs. Shirk, moment of truth, babe. <laughs> <laughs> the agenda at any commencement address is to impart a few life lessons, and I suppose the lesson to draw from my invitation to speak here today is this. Even the most unlikely graduate drawing on the foundation of an Albright education can eventually make something of him or herself. In fact, my college experience here would be a cautionary tale to most observers. <laughs> I arrived here ill-prepared and I departed without any clear goals. While most students matriculate hoping to make a strong impression, I entered Albright already on academic probation. <laughs> To prove my worthiness as a potential Albrightian, I was required to spend the summer before freshman year taking two courses, English 101 and History 101, with two legendary teachers who it was reported eight freshmen alive, Dr. Jim Reppert and Dr. Charles Kissler. So if these things are true, then what am I doing here speaking to you on such a momentous occasion? President McMillan says it's because of my ultimate pro uh, professional success. Uh, but I think otherwise. I think it's because of what Albright College has given me, both in terms of an education, a really solid liberal arts education, and my ability to dream. I did a lot of dreaming while I was here at Albright, in class and otherwise. <laughs> I was a student here as the 1960s lapsed into the 1970s, when Albright College was a dreamer's paradise. 
Rock and roll had suddenly become rock music, and every week another new legend was being introduced to us. Jimi Hendrix, Cream, Jethro Tull, David Bowie, Joe Cocker, James Taylor, Sly, Elton John. He was actually a hip alternative act back then. Hard to believe. My second year here, the pill was introduced, and those all women's dorms took on a completely different blush. <laughs> one week, no one here had ever heard of pot, and the next week, thanks to a professor who shall remain nameless, half the campus was stoned. <laughs> I told you they shouldn't have asked me to speak here today. <laughs> The Vietnam War was raging, and here at school, we vented our activism by taking over the library. Yes, the Albright College Library, that bastion of political controversy. <laughs> During my sophomore year, someone dragged a TV set into the Campus Center lounge, and we watched men walk on the moon for the first time. And the very next weekend, the very next weekend, a carpool left the parking lot right over there, for a little music festival we heard was taking place in upstate New York called Woodstock. To an Albrightian like me, a townie, who had been born in a hospital on 13th Street, whose first home was in, believe it or not, what is now the Albright Court Apartments, who had gone to high school on 13th Street and was now at college here, the outside world was crashing through big time. My dreams were on fire. To those of you sitting here in caps and gowns, this must sound like the Pleistocene era. But come commencement, let me assure you, we were in the exact same place. Because all the dreams, all the grand plans, all the ambitions suddenly come up against the hard wall of reality. This little dreamer's paradise, this gorgeous little campus where everything is secure, was suddenly yanked away. And whether you had plans to go on to graduate school, into business, or were faced with the prospect of hitting the pavement in search of a job, the same two syllables are uttered by all of our lips. Uh-oh. <laughs> this day is a time to celebrate, and I hope you all do it in style. But tomorrow, wherever you may find yourselves, newly shorn of the Albright security blanket, you have only to rely on what you learned here and those dreams. Those two assets are powerful juju, and together, they can take you on a fantastic ride on the, into the future. Trust me, really. I left Albright in a fog of uncertainty. I always assumed I'd be a professional man like my father and my uncles. But sometimes, under the strangest of circumstances, goals get sidetracked. And a few weeks after I graduated, I found myself on a Bieber bus bound for New York City with only a suitcase and my parents' belief that I might find a better future there. I had been cut adrift, as many of you will be tomorrow, with nothing more than my diploma to show for it. Pretty scary. I wasn't aimless, but I had no idea what I was aiming for anymore. Do what you love, my parents insisted. Trust in your dreams. Yeah, well, great advice, Mom and Dad, but that sounded like a line from the Karate Kid to me. <laughs> what I loved was rock and roll. Was it possible I could knit that into some kind of actual paying gig? Aside from my Albright education, I had been a guitar player most of my life, and putting the two of those credentials together, I actually landed a job as, a, as an assistant to a music producer for the princely sum of $87 a week, and I was happy to get it. Look, when I got out of college and went to New York, I leaned on everybody I knew, and my parents did the same thing, until a man I'd never met before offered to call a few friends in the music business for me. I'm telling you all of this, you have to be relentless, willing to do anything within reason to get your foot in the door. Two or three months later, while daydreaming after the office had closed, I bumped into another kid my age who was also in New York looking to uh, break into the music business. And as uh, President McMillan told you, his name was Bruce Springsteen. And suddenly, as our paths collided, my dreams had come true. I became the manager and sideman to a very hot rock and roll artist, and we rocked the Casbah from one end of the globe to the other, including a jam-packed concert at my old alma mater right here, right over there in what you now refer to as the gym. We call it the field house. Um, after six years on the road with Bruce, when I thought nothing could be more exciting, 
I became the manager of Elton John, who at the time was the biggest star on the scene. But only two years later, I was exhausted from it all. Seven, eight years of rock and roll can do that to you. And the smart ones, I'd like to believe those of us with an Albright education, get out while their sanity is intact. So once again, at the age of 29, I found myself adrift in New York City without a career and only my Albright education to fall back on. At least now I had a resume, a rock and roll resume, which was about as useful as my diploma. But I was looking at the same long, daunting robe that faced me the day after graduation. I was right back where I had started. What now? What to do with the next 30 or 40 years? My thoughts drifted back to a time here at Albright when for a brief moment I'd enjoyed writing, keeping a journal, and writing, reading great novels. I even romanticized becoming a writer like my idols Ernest Hemingway and Philip Roth. That hadn't seemed like a promising avenue when I entered Albright. In English 101, that summer course that I'd been forced to take, Dr. Reppert assigned us a composition with a fluffy topic like how we spent our summer vacation or Freud and the crisis of our culture. I can't remember which. In any case, he picked one of our essays and he read it aloud to the class, mocking every page, every paragraph, every sentence as utter gibberish. What do we know from this essay, he asked us rhetorically. Nobody dared raise their hand. We know this. We know this person will never be a writer. Of course, that paper was mine. That was. A few years later, over a cutthroat game of pool, Jim Rippert urged me to write if I really wanted to write, not to give up, even if he'd been particularly hard on me. So I started with subjects I, excuse me, subjects I knew, Bob Dylan, and then the Beatles. And I'm pleased to say that next month, my ninth book, a biography of Julia Child, will be published on the centenary of her birth. And following that, I've been awarded a presidential biography. In the fall, I'll begin work on Ronald Reagan's life. So I can't help thinking that where Dr. Reppert may be, up there or down there where many of us believed he should be, <laughs> he's probably smiling right now. But you know, enough about me. This, this day, this incredible festive milestone is all yours to savor. And no matter how cool you pretend to be, sitting there in your caps and gowns. There's not a person in this class right now who is in a bundle of dreams. And I have to tell you, that's a pretty good juice to go out of here on. I'm not sure a good college education even affords you a good job, certainly not in this economy. But it does give you a wonderful foundation to reach for something great, something that may even be beyond your reach, maybe only a dream to perhaps change gears some years down the pike as I did. And I hope my long, strange trip is an apt illustration. My twisted path may not be the message that your educator, educators want you to hear this morning, but then they should have opened that box beneath the science building and checked the list before inviting me. With a little luck, several years from now, you might just find your name on it. Class of 2012, I have only this last thing to say to you. Dream big, follow those dreams, go wherever they may lead you. Your adventure starts right now. Go get started, thank you. <laughs>